The tale of a youth who set out to learn what fear was. From the Blue Fairy Book by Andrew Lang and Lenora Blanche Allen. A father had two sons, of whom the eldest was clever and bright, and always knew what he was about. But the youngest was stupid and couldn't learn or understand anything. So much so that those who saw him exclaimed, Oh, what a burden he'll be to his father. Now, when there was anything to be done, the eldest had always to do it. But if something was required late or in the night time, and the way led through the churchyard or some such ghostly place, he always replied, Oh, no, father, nothing will induce me to go there. It makes me shudder, for he was afraid. Or when they sat an evening round the fire telling stories which made one's flesh creep, the listeners sometimes said, Oh, it makes one shudder. The youngest sat in the corner, heard the exclamation, and could not understand what it meant. They are always saying it makes one shudder. It makes one shudder. Nothing makes me shudder. It's probably an art quite beyond me. Now it happened that his father said to him one day, Hearken you there in the corner. You are growing big and strong, and you must learn to earn your own bread. Look at your brother, what pains he takes. But all the money I've spent on your education is thrown away. My dear father, he replied, I will gladly learn. In fact, if it were possible, I should like to learn to shudder. I don't understand that a bit yet. The eldest laughed when he heard this, and thought to himself, Good heavens, what a ninny my brother is. He'll never come to any good. As the twig is bent, so is the tree inclined. The father sighed and answered him, You shall soon learn to shudder, but that won't help you make a living. Shortly after this, when the sexton came to pay a visit, the father broke out to him and told him what a bad hand his youngest son was at everything. He knew nothing and learnt nothing. Only think, when I asked him how he purposed gaining a livelihood, he actually asked to be taught to shudder. If that's all that he wants, said the sexton, I can teach him that. Just you send him to me. I'll soon polish him up. The father was quite pleased with the proposal, because he thought it would be a good discipline for the youth. And so the sexton took him into his house, and his duty was to toll the bell. After a few days, he woke him at midnight and bade him rise up and climb into the tower and toll. Now, my friend, I'll teach you to shudder, thought he. He stole forth secretly in front, and when the youth was up above and had turned round to grasp the bell rope, he saw, standing opposite the hole of the belfry, a white figure. Who's there? He called out, but the figure gave no answer, and neither stirred nor moved. Answer, cried the youth, or be gone, you have no business here at this hour of night. But the sexton remained motionless, so that the youth might think it was a ghost. The youth called out a second time, What do you want here? Speak if you're an honest fellow or I'll knock you down the stairs. The sexton thought, mm, he can't mean that in earnest. So he gave forth no sound, and stood as if he were made of stone. Then the youth shouted at him a third time, and as that had no effect, he made a dash at the spectre, and knocked it down the stairs so that it fell about ten steps and remained lying in a corner. Thereupon he told the bell, 
went home to bed without saying a word, and fell asleep. The sexton's wife waited a long time for her husband, but he never appeared. At last she became anxious and woke the youth and asked, Don't you know where my husband is? He went up to the tower in front of you. No, answered the youth. But someone stood on the stairs up there, just opposite the trap door in the belfry. And because he wouldn't answer me or go away, I took him for a rogue and I knocked him down. You'd better go and see if that was he. I should be much distressed if it were. The wife ran and found her husband, who was lying groaning in a corner with his leg broken. She carried him down and then hurriedly with loud protestations to the youth's father. Your son has been the cause of a pretty misfortune, she cried. He threw my husband downstairs so that he broke his leg. Take the good-for-nothing wretch out of our house. The father was horrified, hurried to the youth and gave him a scolding. What unholy pranks are these? The evil one must have put them into your head. Father, he replied, only listen to me. I am quite guiltless. He stood there in the night, like one who meant harm. I didn't know who it was, and warned him three times to speak or be gone. Oh, groaned the father, you'll bring me nothing but misfortune. Get out of my sight, I won't have anything to do with you. Yes, father, willingly. Only wait till daylight, then I'll set out, and I'll learn to shudder. And in that way I shall be master of an art which will gain me a living. Learn what you will, said the father. It's all one to me. Here are fifty dollars for you. Set forth into the wide world with them. But see and tell no one where you come from, or who your father is. For I am ashamed of you. Yes, father, whatever you wish. And if that's all you ask, I can easily keep it in my mind. When day broke, the youth put the fifty dollars into his pocket, set out on the hard high road, and kept muttering to himself, If only I could learn to shudder. If I could only shudder. Just at this moment, a man came by who heard the youth speaking to himself. And when they had gone on a bit, and were in sight of the gallows, the man said to him, Look, there is a tree where seven people have been hanged, and are now learning to fly. Sit down under it, and wait till nightfall, and then you'll pretty soon learn to shudder. Well, if that's all I have to do, answered the youth, it's easily done. But if I learn to shudder so quickly, then you shall have my fifty dollars. Just come back to me tomorrow morning, early. Then the youth went to the gallows tree and sat down underneath it and waited for the evening. And because he felt cold, he lit himself a fire. But at midnight, it got so chilled that in spite of the fire, he couldn't keep warm. And as the wind blew the corpses one against the other, tossing them to and fro, He thought to himself, If you are perishing down here by the fire, how those poor things up there must be shaking and shivering. And because he had a tender heart, he put up a ladder which he climbed, unhooked one body after the other, and took down all seven. Then he stirred the fire, blew it up, and placed them all around it in a circle that they might warm themselves. But they sat there and did not move, and the fire caught their clothes. Then he spoke, Take care, or I'll hang you up again. But the dead men did not hear, and they let their rags go on burning. Then he got angry and said, If you aren't careful yourselves, then I can't help you, and I don't mean to burn with you and he hung them up again in a row. Then he sat down at his fire and fell asleep. 
On the following morning, the man came to him, and, wishing to get his fifty dollars, said, Now you know what it is to shudder. No, he answered. How should I? Those fellows up there never opened their mouths, and were so stupid that they let a few old tatters that they have on their bodies burn. Then the man saw that he wouldn't get his fifty dollars that day, and he went off, saying, Well, I'm blessed if I ever met such a person in my life before. The youth, too, went on his way, and began to murmur to himself, Oh, if I could only shudder! If I could only shudder! A carrier who was walking behind him heard these words and asked him, Who are you? Ah, I don't know, said the youth. Where do you hail from? I don't know. Who's your father? I mayn't say, he replied again. What are you constantly muttering to yourself? Oh, said the youth, I would give worlds to shudder, but no one can teach me. Stuff and nonsense, spoke the carrier. Come along with me and I'll soon put that right. The youth went with the carrier, and in the evening they reached an inn, where they were to spend the night. Then, just as he was entering the room, he said again, quite aloud, Oh, if only I could shudder! The landlord, who heard this, laughed and said, Well, if that's what you're sighing for, you shall be given every opportunity here. Oh, hold your tongue, said the landlord's wife beside him. So many people have paid for their curiosity with their lives. It were a thousand pities if those beautiful eyes were never to behold daylight. But the youth said, No matter how difficult, I insist on learning it. Why, that's what I've been set out to do. He left the landlord no peace until he told him that in the neighbourhood stood a haunted castle, where one could easily learn to shudder if one only kept watch in it for three nights. The king had promised the man who dared to do this thing, his daughter as wife, and she was the most beautiful maiden under the sun. There was also much treasure hidden in the castle, guarded by evil spirits, which would then be free, and was sufficient to make a poor man more than rich. Many had already gone in, but so far none had ever come out. So the youth went to the king and spoke. If I were allowed, I should much like to watch for three nights in the castle. The king looked at him, and because he pleased him, he said, You can ask for three things, none of them living, and those you may take with you into the castle. Then he answered, Well, I should beg for a fire, a turning lathe, and a carving bench with the knife attached. On the following day, the king had everything put into the castle, and then night drew on the youth, and he took his position there, lit a bright fire in one of the rooms, placed the carving bench with the knife close to it, and sat himself down on the turning lathe. Oh, if only I could shudder, he said. But I shan't learn it here, either. Towards midnight, he wanted to make up the fire, and as he was blowing up a blaze, he heard a shriek from a corner. Shh! How cold we are! You fools, he cried. Why do you scream and make such a noise? If you're cold, come and sit by the fire and warm yourselves. And, as he spoke, two huge black cats sprang fiercely towards and sat down, one on each side of him, and they gazed wildly at him with their fiery eyes. After a time, when they had warmed themselves, they said, Friend, shall we play a little game of cards? Mm, why not, he replied. But first, let me see your paws. Then they stretched out their claws. Ha! <laughs> said he. What long nails you've got. Wait a minute, I must first cut them off. Thereupon he seized them by the scruff of their necks, 
lifted them onto the carving bench and screwed down their paws firmly. After watching you narrowly, said he, I no longer feel any desire to play cards with you. And with these words he struck them dead and threw them out into the water. But when he had thus sent the two of them to their final rest, and was again about to sit down at the fire, out of every nook and corner came forth black cats and black dogs with fiery chains, in such swarms that he couldn't possibly get away from them. They yelled in the most ghastly manner, jumped upon his fire, scattered it all, and tried to put it out. He looked on quietly for a time, but when it got beyond a joke, he seized his carving knife and called out, Be off, you rabble rout! And he let fly at them. Some of them fled away, and the others he struck dead, and threw them out into the pond below. When he returned, he blew up the sparks of the fire once more and warmed himself. And as he sat thus, his eyes refused to keep open any longer, and a desire to sleep stole over him. Then he looked round him and beheld in the corner a large bed. The very thing, he said to himself, and laid himself down in it. But when he wished to close his eyes, the bed began to move by itself and ran all round the castle. Capital, he said, only a little quicker. Then the bed sped on as if drawn by six horses, over thresholds and stairs, up this way and down that, and all of a sudden, with a bound it turned over, upside down, and lay like a mountain on the top of him. When he tossed the blankets and pillows in the air, and emerged from underneath, he said, Now... Anyone who has a fancy for it may go a drive. He lay down by his fire, and then slept until daylight. In the morning the king came, and when he beheld him lying on the ground, he imagined the ghost had been too much for him, and that he was dead. Then he said, Ah, oh, what a pity! And such a fine fellow he was! The youth heard this, got up and said, it's not come to that yet, when the king was astonished, but very glad, and asked how it had fared with him. First rate, he answered, and now I survived the one night, I shall get through the other two also. The landlord, when he went to him, opened his eyes wide and said, Well, I never thought to see you alive again. Have you learnt now what shuddering is? No, he replied. It's quite hopeless, if someone could only tell me how to. The second night, he went up again to the old castle, sat down at the fire, and began his old refrain. Oh, if only I could shudder. As midnight approached, a noise and din broke out, at first gentle, but gradually increasing. Then all was quiet for a minute, and at length, with a loud scream, Half of a man dropped down the chimney and fell before him. Hi up there, he shouted. There's another half wanting down here, that's not enough. Then the din commenced once more. There was shrieking and a yelling, and then the other half fell down. Wait a bit, he said. I'll stir up the fire for you. When he had done this and again looked round, the two pieces had united, and a horrible-looking man sat on his seat. Come, said the youth. I didn't bargain for that. The seat is mine. The man tried to shove him away, but the youth wouldn't allow it for a moment, and, pushing him off by force, sat down in his place again. Then more men dropped down, one after the other, who, fetching nine skeleton legs, and two skulls, put them up and played ninepins with them. The youth thought that he would like to play as well, and he said, Look here, do you mind my joining the game? No, not if you have the money. I've money enough, he replied. But 
your bulls aren't very round. Then he took the skulls, placed him on his lathe, and turned them till they were round. Now they'll roll even better, said he. Now the fun really begins. He played with them and lost some of his money, but when twelve struck, everything vanished before his eyes. He lay down and slept peacefully. The next morning the king came, anxious for news. How have you got on this time? he asked. I played nine pins, he answered, and lost a few pence. Didn't you shudder then? No such luck, said he. I made myself merry. Oh, if I only knew what it was to shudder. Then, on the third night, he sat down again on his bench and said, in the most desponding way, Oh, if only I could shudder. When it got late, six big men came in carrying a coffin, and then he cried, <laughs> That's most likely my little cousin who only died a few weeks ago. And beckoning with his finger, he called out, Come, my little cousin, come. They placed the coffin on the ground. In it lay a dead man. He felt his face, and it was cold as ice. Wait, he said. I'll heat you up a bit. And he went to the fire, warmed his hand, and laid it on the man's face. But the dead remained cold. Then he lifted him out, sat him down at the fire, laid him on his knee, and rubbed his arms that the blood should circulate again. When that too had no effect, it occurred to him that if two people lay together in bed, they warmed each other. So he put him into the bed, covered him up, and laid down beside him. After a time, the corpse became warm and began to move. Then the youth said, Now, my little cousin, what would have happened if I hadn't warmed you? But the dead man rose up and cried out, now I will strangle you. What? said he. Is that all the thanks I get? You shall be put straight back in your coffin. And he lifted him up, threw him in, and closed the lid. Then the six men came and carried him out again. <sighs> I simply can't shudder, he said. And it's clear I shan't learn it in a lifetime here. Then a man entered, of more than ordinary size, and of a very fearful appearance. But he was old and had a long white beard. Oh, you miserable creature! Now you will soon know what it is to shudder, he cried. For you must die. Not so quickly, answered the youth. If I am to die, you must catch me first. I shall soon lay hold of you, spoke the monster. Gently, gently, don't boast too much. I'm as strong as you, and stronger too. We'll soon see that, said the old man. If you are stronger than I, then I'll let you off. Come, let's have a try. Then he led him through some dark passages to a forge, and grasping an axe, he drove one of the anvils with a blow into the earth. Oh, <laughs> I can do better than that, cried the youth, and he went to the other anvil. The old man drew near in order to watch closely, and his white beard hung right down. Then the youth seized the axe, cleft the anvil open, and jammed in the old man's beard. Now I have you, said the youth. This time it's your turn to die. Then he seized an iron rod and belaboured the old man until he, whimpering, begged him to leave off, and he would give him great riches. The youth drew out an axe and let him go, and the old man led him back to the castle, and showed him in a cellar three chests of gold. One of these, he said, belongs to the poor, one to the king, and the third is yours. 
At that moment, the clock struck twelve, and the spirit vanished, leaving the youth alone in the dark. I'll surely be able to find a way out, said he, and, groping about at length, he found his way back to the room, and he fell asleep at his fire. The next morning the king came and said, Well, now you surely learnt to shudder. No, he answered. What can it be? My dead cousin was there, and an old bearded man came, who showed me heaps of money down below there. But what shuddering is, no one's told me. And then the king spoke. You have freed the castle from its curse, and you shall marry my daughter. That's all charming, he said, but I still don't know what it is to shudder. Then the gold was brought up, and the wedding was celebrated. But the young king, though he loved his wife dearly, and thought he was very happy, still kept on saying, Oh, if only I could shudder. At last he reduced her to despair, and then her maid said, I'll help you. We'll soon make him shudder. So she went out to the stream that flowed through the garden, and had a pail full of little gudgeon brought to her. At night, when the young king was asleep, his wife had to pull the clothes off him, and pour the pail full of little gudgeon over him, so that the little fish swam all about him. Then he awoke and cried out, Oh, how I shudder, how I shudder, dear wife! Yes, now I know what shuddering is. I'd like to take a moment to say a big thank you to the members of the channel, as well as my patrons on Patreon, for supporting my work. Folklore and fairy tales play such a big part in my life, and I love being able to share them here with you. If you're interested in finding out more about channel membership, you can find all the information here, or in the link in the video description. Or you can head over to my Patreon page. You can find the link in the description of this video, or on my YouTube homepage. Thanks for watching, and thanks again to the members of the channel and my patrons for your support. But for now, stay safe, and I'll see you in the next video.